Welcome to Transform Now, the podcast brought to you by robotic process automation pioneer, SSNC Blue Prism. Digital transformation has the potential to reshape the way companies service their customers, engage their employees, and manage their operations. Whether you're looking to develop strategies, tactics, or best practices to positively impact the future of work, or you're curious to see how other companies have successfully navigated their digital transformation programs, then this podcast is for you. We're here to help you transform now. Hello, everyone. I'm Brad Hairston with SSNC Blue Prism. Welcome to the Transform Now podcast. Today, I'm thrilled to have as my guest, Miguel Carrasco, Global Public Sector Lead at BCGX and based in Sydney, Australia. Miguel has been on the podcast once before, way back in 2021, when he joined me to talk about the future of work in the public sector. Today, he and I will be talking about how technology leaders can get a handle on a number of converging issues that are bearing down on them. Welcome back, Miguel, and long time no see, my friend. Why don't you update us on yourself and your role at BCG? Thanks, Brad, and great to be with you again. Hello to all of your listeners. I am pleased to say that life post-pandemic is certainly treating us very well. There's lots of great challenges around to work with our clients on. Um, and as you said, one of the key things that's happened since we talked about last time was we have uh, established a new unit, a tech build and design unit called BCGX. And I actually now lead the public sector industry stream for BCGX. Well, the formation of BCGX certainly is a very big development since you and I last talked and, and congratulations on your role in, in the new organization. Tell us more about it. And, and one question I have is, are you the first of the big three to create something like this, a dedicated technology arm or are others doing the same? I think you'll find that sort of the industry has been responding to clients' needs for support in designing and building great digital products and services, particularly mm -hmm. ones that are enabled by data and increasingly AI. And so what we found is that there was this period over the last four or five years where we had to, in respond to that demand, develop rapidly a number of units and capabilities in data science, in corporate venturing and innovation, in technology, architecture, engineering, and so on. And the feedback we were getting from clients was that we had something quite unique in when you combined all of those things with our traditional core strategy function and transformation capabilities that clients understand and know us very well for, when you combine all of those things together, we actually had quite a compelling and unique value proposition that was not really met by anyone else in the market. And in order to make it easier to bring those capabilities together at the right time for clients, we brought all of those data, digital tech talent into a single unit called BCGX. And that has helped us streamline the process of integrating those functions and capabilities. Mm -hmm. and, and I think in the market, it's also helped us reposition what BCG is known for and making sure that people are aware of just how much capability we have to help them not just do the strategy and transform, but also actually do the design and build and launch of great digital products and services. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Well, Miguel, earlier this year, you collaborated with several BCG colleagues on a really good article that talks about this new era of technology we're facing and the, the pressing issues that tech leaders will need to address going forward. And I got to tell you, after reading it, it gave me a whole new level of respect for CIOs and, and CTOs. Their plate is definitely loaded right now with a lot of things to, to figure out. So I'd like to dive into the areas that the article addresses, if that's okay with you. Perhaps we could start by talking about how technology leaders can move beyond aspirations and 
really embrace this idea of cross-functional teams. That's certainly a struggle for most organizations to do that well. And the article called that out and, and talked about the importance of bringing those two together to share common goals and to work together productively. Talk about how that can happen. Mm. Where some of this thinking started and the sort of the back drop to the article was really thinking through the trends and trying to project out 10, 15, 20 years time, what, what do we think the future of the tech function is? And as you said, there's been like a lot of demand on the technology function. Everything these days is data and tech enabled. So there's, there's been huge pressure to not just run all of the infrastructure and operations, but doing all these projects that require tech expertise and talent and capabilities. And, and so you've got this technology unit, which in many organizations didn't really exist 20, 30 years ago, right? Like mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's grown from nothing to become a central shared service function in most, if not all organizations. And we have tried a number of different things to improve the way digital and technology projects are delivered. We know that in order to succeed, they really need to be business driven. There needs to be a high level of business engagement, ownership and accountability. And I, I empathize with a lot of the technology functions that are being asked to deliver these things. And then often the business isn't really there in terms of their engagement and ownership and leadership or their ability to define their requirements or their ability to resolve ambiguities about their strategic direction or the future business model and operating models that are so critical um, to actually delivering successful projects. And so, you know, many organizations have implemented multidisciplinary teams, agile ways of working in an attempt to try and improve that business and technology collaboration. But there's actually a, an interesting trend, a counter trend perhaps enabled by the evolution of low code, no code, software as a service, cloud-based offerings, which increasingly enables you to put technology in the hands of the users much more directly. And instead of needing to set up a project or set up a product team in order to deliver something, you could literally put users in an environment where they can define and redefine their requirements over time and self-serve um, using low code, no code solutions. And so that fundamentally challenges the notion of, do you even need a central IT team anymore, right? Do you just give the business access to these low code, no code solutions and let them solve their own problems, meet their own needs and evolve the solutions over time as they're required? Do you just decentralize all of the design development resources and engineering resources and put them all in the business and just say, here, mm -hmm. you know, we wanted them to be close together. So the ultimate is just merge them and have them in a single unit with the business if necessary to help them to implement and configure those solutions to meet their needs. Mm. I think that's a potentially quite a provocative and challenging statement to make. And I don't think it's true. I don't think you can just do away with the technology function because the, yeah. the reality is in order or that kind of model to work in a large organization, you would need to have some common platforms. You'd need to have some standards, guardrails. You'd need to have some architecture to enable interoperability between different teams working in different products and solutions. So I do think there is still a, a significant role for a central technology function to provide the right infrastructure, the right platforms, the right governance and environment for that. But I. I do think a, a lot of the way we have done traditional software development mm -hmm. and engineering is changing and will continue to change and evolve even more so as we get more automated solutions and mm -hmm. things like sort of software engineering co-pilots enabled by AI, again, really democratizes and decentralizes the way that we design, develop, deliver IT solutions. Mm. The article says that the tech function must be seen as a partner in, not a barrier to innovation. That's a pretty huge paradigm shift in most companies, isn't it? 
And I'm curious, do you believe that this decentralization, this democratization of IT and, and technology to the business, is that part of what will help the technology function really obtain this, this persona as being a, a partner, not a barrier? Yeah, I mean, I, ironically, I, I, I think, you know, in some ways by decentralizing responsibility for the design and configuration and deployment of solutions to the business, you are actually giving them control that they feel they often don't have. Um, mm -hmm. And the dynamic and relationship between business and IT, which is sometimes collaborative, but often not. Right. Because technology is, is trying to enforce particular patterns or mm -hmm. particular standards and often well-intentioned because they're trying to ensure reusability. They're trying to ensure scalability. They're trying to ensure security, et cetera. So there, there's sometimes conflicting interests or conflicting objectives at play between business and IT mm -hmm. that, that, that has sort of hampered that relationship. But I actually think the way that the technology is evolving allows you to break that trade-off and avoid it having to be a compromise. We can have our scalability, we can have our security, we can have our reusability mm -hmm. and efficiency, you know, and meet the business need in a more timely way uh, by the way we use and apply and deploy these sort of low-code, no-code solutions. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think the fundamental paradigm shift is how we think about meeting business need and ensuring that we are using as much I would describe it as off the shelf, out of the box functionality mm -hmm. as possible um, right. and only really doing custom code development where there's a genuine strategic advantage or value in doing so. And, mm -hmm. and I, I don't think that we've often drawn the line in the right place. I think I still see too many examples of clients that are investing a lot of money in big technology projects um, mm -hmm. and they're doing a lot of custom code development ostensibly under the banner of meeting business requirements, or it has to be that way for business mm -hmm. purposes. But in many cases, it's not. And the out of the box process or the industry standard template, which is best practice would actually be better for them. And it would be much better to put that investment into mm -hmm. uh, things that genuinely are unique and innovative and drive advantage and real shareholder value. Right. And, and so I, I, I think coming back to sort of where does it make sense or where are you going to get the best return on investment mm -hmm. out of that crucial, particularly human resource, and where could we just leverage more of the industry solutions that are increasingly mature, um, mm -hmm. highly configurable, easy to deploy, and, and much, much more robust than yep. anything you could develop in-house yourself. Miguel, you mentioned large technology projects. So that leads me to another topic that I want to ask you about, and that is the technical debt, the legacy systems that IT is still grappling with. How, how can technology leaders accelerate tech modernization so that AI data and technology are fully woven into the business? We probably need to do more work on the business side rather than the technology side. I don't think I would get too much pushback from tech leaders about the the benefits of modular, flexible architecture, right? Mm -hmm. uh, standardized, layered architecture with interoperability enabled by APIs and so on. That kind of thinking in technology is actually, I would say, it is the default way of thinking. What we probably need to do a bit more work on is on the business side of things, really making sure we understand where, where is their unique competitive advantage? Where is their strategic value in sort of running the business in a particular way mm -hmm. versus say, adopting a standardized approach? For example, in, right. in, in ERP and CRM and supply chain management or BPM solutions, et cetera, or digital experience layers, there's a lot that you can get these days from the platform vendors who have invested billions of dollars in developing their solutions, creating 
the features and functionalities, creating industry templates and so on. Why would you put your money in investing a better payroll process when there's already yeah. a really good world's best practice way of doing that? Mm -hmm. uh, and do you really think you can develop a better CRM than Microsoft and Salesforce? There's so much intellectual property. There's so much ongoing R and D into these products. It's like use and leverage everything you can from those sorts of solutions and then change the business where necessary in order to, to adjust the processes or adjust the organization structures or the forms or the data, et cetera, and really invest your time and energy into genuine innovation, mm -hmm. things that don't exist, products and services that meet a particular unmet customer need mm -hmm. in the market. And, and th so that, that to me is, is the shift we need to make, making better decisions on the business side where it makes sense to invest and, and how to think about them more as commodity. Mm -hmm. um, well, something's a commodity, then we don't need to do our own electricity, right? Like we don't run our own power plants. And increasingly, as you move up the stack of software, there's a lot more things that are like electricity that we should just take as a given and let someone else do versus mm -hmm. where you get real value is in in the data in the, yeah. and how you drive intelligence and better decision-making of the data out of these systems. But too many people are spending yep. all of their time re-engineering the processes. And as a result, locking themselves into a high-cost sustainment model um, going mm -hmm. forward. And I, I just don't think that's a good, a good value for money investment. Yeah. Miguel, you mentioned leveraging third parties to do things that your company is not really good at doing. Let, let's talk about automation and partnerships with external collaborators. How can those be deployed to free up scarce tech talent? Look, I think the, the world we work in and live in now, I would describe it as a sort of an open ecosystem, right? Like we, I think it's important to recognize what you do well and what resources and capabilities you have and play to your strengths mm -hmm. and then partner or work with others. And I think we've taken this approach very much in our own business, opening up to working a lot more with technology partners, developing relationships and alliances and so on with a whole range of players across the spectrum. And what that has enabled us to do, for example, is to be able to offer clients a more integrated solution or mm -hmm. to, to take a more end-to-end -end approach and in some ways be very disruptive to traditional markets as well. By working with technology vendors and technology partners, you can actually come up with a value proposition that is genuinely unique, that wouldn't exist mm -hmm. otherwise, um, that, that no one else offers. And I think companies can think about that as well, you know, in, mm -hmm. in the way they look at their own uh, environment and what they do in-house versus what they source from partners and third parties. There's advantages in working with others. As I mentioned earlier, the level of R&D and investment that people are making in those products, you can't match that internally. And increasingly, as we move more into things like artificial intelligence and the development and investment required to create and sustain some of these capabilities, it's really going to be a, a shared resource or an, or an open resource. So I, I think the mindset to have is to really be open to partnering, open to working with other players in the ecosystem and really stitching together, right? The key capability is going to be the orchestration you know, and how you bring together the right people and capabilities. Because the reality is there's just not enough talent in the world to meet the demand, right? Like the, right. The, every company in, in every organization, the demand for what they want to do with data and technology exceeds yeah. the supply, right? Yeah. Um, sometimes by multiple factors. And so we need to start looking for ways for how we can meet the demand without having to rely on people and humans to do everything, mm -hmm. right? Because if the answer is just throw more bodies at everything, we're yep. going to run out of bodies. And so I think looking for opportunities to do more automation, to use AI more, to automate things wherever possible, to augment the humans mm -hmm. that are doing the work to make them more productive. And I think the developments there in the last six months or so around Gen AI have really opened up a whole nother 
um, level of productivity that will hopefully allow us to meet that demand, that unmet demand. It definitely sounds like you believe companies will need to have more partners going forward versus less. I, I completely agree with you on that. So what should technology leaders do to reimagine their tech talent strategy so they can get the recruits they want and hold on to them? We are still, as you said, in a very labor constrained world, and I'm not sure that's going to change anytime in the near future. So talk about what they can do to overcome this. Yeah, so there's a, probably a few layers to this. So one is within your own organization, there will be tremendous talent that is probably under leveraged, both within the tech function and outside the tech function, right? Going back to our earlier part of our conversation, we actually need to empower everyone in the organization mm -hmm. to be able to take advantage and work with some of these technologies. It's no longer just the domain of the IT group. And so the first order question is, how can I maximize and upskill and reskill the talent within the organization already in data, in AI, in tech, in digital, and so on? Because I, I, that is the easiest place to look and the one that will probably give you the best return in the short term, right? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, a lot of organizations actually underestimate that. They think they've got to go outside and hire in the market. And the reality is when you do that, you're in a, in a very competitive market. And so you know, if you're relying on external recruitment to meet your future data, digital tech needs, I think you're going to end up being disappointed about the pace with which you can attract the right talent. So doing things like internal academies, digital academies, data academies, mid-career upskilling and reskilling programs looking in non-traditional talent, thinking very laterally about where you might find talent. There's been some really good analysis done by the World Economic Forum and other people like BCG and Fathom and so on that looks at the similarity of tasks and functions mm -hmm. between jobs. And you can see that it's, it, there are pathways, career pathways for people. And you don't always have to have done a computer science or a technology degree to succeed or have a successful career. So I think a lot more bringing people into the tech world or taking the tech world out to the people, right? Whichever mm -hmm. way you like. But the point is that maximize the opportunities inside your organization, leverage things like micro credentials and the online courses and programs that are available, the certificates mm -hmm. and, and so on. So it's almost everyone's responsibility to really upskill for the future. And then beyond that, I guess, Investing in collaborations with universities, industry alliances to really try and tap into potentially, again, workers that may not be yep. thinking about this as a career. And, mm -hmm. and actually, there are plenty of people out there that are looking for work as well. So how can you create bridges and pathways for those people to be part of this? I think, I think that's important. All uh, very interesting ideas. And I, I love the career pathways that you talked about. And I, I've read a lot of the Fathom point of view on, on that. And I, I love it. The idea of accountants being really good resources to convert into cybersecurity <laughs> resources, some correlations that you wouldn't naturally think about. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have, um, you know, untapped talent in parts of the population, like people with disability. Mm -hmm. um, yep. I've seen some terrific programs creating pathways for, say, people with neurodiversity. Right. and becoming data scientists or yeah. working in the technology space. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think really opening up to sort of non-traditional talent pools can also help mm -hmm. us meet some of our diversity and inclusion objectives as well. Yeah, totally agree. So one more really big topic to cover with you from the, from the article, and it's one of the more complex ones, the whole topic of regulation AI and data oversight, but also mixing in cyber risk. And then finally, just all the expectations that, you know, investors and shareholders and citizens have for organizations to be more environmentally sustainable. That's a lot of stuff that's bearing down on companies in general, but IT is certainly feeling the brunt of that. So talk about how the tech function can help the business thrive in this environment. You're right. It, there's a lot of 
pressure on organizations these days. And it's, I think only going to increase as we're seeing at the moment, the push to introduce more safeguards and regulations around the use of AI, for example. So I'm optimistic generally though, about the potential of technology to help solve some of these challenges as well. I do think it is incumbent on tech leaders to, to, to step up and help the rest of their organizations because they are in some ways best placed and the most knowledgeable about both the upside and the potential opportunities, but also the risks. And I, I think in general, taking a risk-based approach, I think is, is sensible, not being fearful of it, but being responsible, you know, and we mm -hmm. talk about this a lot about this idea of responsible AI and responsible yep. technology. And there's been some really good contributions in this space from a number of different thought leaders about how to ensure that technology and evolution adoption and so on, that it is genuinely benefiting humanity and that what we're doing and how mm -hmm. we're doing it, we're doing it in a way that doesn't erode human rights and it hopefully actually enhances it, um, that mm -hmm. it doesn't erode privacy. There's a risk, of course, of these things if they're done poorly mm -hmm. and have a lot of negative consequences. But on the flip side, if they're done well, it, yeah. it can actually improve and enhance some of these things. And so my hope is that by having a, uh, an open, mature, transparent conversation about these things, we can avoid the extremes, you know, of catastrophizing or evangelizing and actually stay more in the sensible center and have a balanced discussion, being aware of the risks and putting in place approaches to manage those risks mm -hmm. uh, in a way that doesn't impede innovation and doesn't hamstring us from taking advantage of the benefits and opportunities that all of these technologies bring. Yeah, it certainly feels like IT and risk management, those two functions are going to have to be two peas in a pod <laughs> going forward. They're going to have to be even more tightly correlated. It'll be everyone's responsibility. It's not something you can delegate to like the chief risk officer and say mm -hmm. it, it's their problem. Right. It's something I think we all have to take ownership for if, yep. we, if we're going to use the tools and we need to do that responsibly, much the same way that if you're going to get in the car and drive, then mm -hmm. you have to be aware, you have to know how to drive and you have to be aware of the risks and drive safely and responsibly. And I, I think the same is true of technology. Right. So Miguel, to wrap up, I want to ask you as the global public sector lead for BCGX to share your thoughts on the advent of generative AI, such as chat GPT. We've talked quite a bit on the podcast about Gen AI, but we really haven't touched on how it will impact the public sector. What are your thoughts on this? You can look at this through two different lenses from a public sector perspective. One is mm -hmm. as a user of the technology, like any other organization, and what are the use cases and applications of it in order to improve policy, improve customer service, improve regulation, improve mm -hmm. operations and so on in government. And there's some great uh, examples already of different governments starting to experiment um, mm -hmm. with Gen AI and, and things like chat, GPT, et cetera. And a lot of that in some ways isn't that different to what's in the private mm -hmm. sector in, in terms of how it might help with mm -hmm. synthesizing and research and writing documents and doing analysis, which there's a lot of that in government. Right. And also in some of the customer service applications, making it easier for people to get answers, consistent answers. Mm -hmm. It could improve accessibility. It might help us identify non-compliance and improve fraud, reduce fraud and things like that. So there's a lot of analogies in terms of the use cases that we see in the private sector. In some ways, that's all about what we do today and doing it faster or doing it better. What we're probably yet still to uncover are some of the things that we didn't know we could do, or what are some of the new things that it will enable us to do. Mm -hmm. And that's an exciting, interesting space of innovation that we, we can get into another time. There's, of course, the other side of government and the public sector, which is its role as a regulator 
Right, and, right. And so governments are thinking about to what extent do, do existing laws, legislation and regulations, are they adequate? Do they need to be updated or upgraded? And then what new regulations potentially do you need to put in place? There's obviously been already a lot of work done on this in the EU around the AI Act. Um, mm -hmm. Various other jurisdictions are looking very closely at that. Some of them are doing their own consultations processes, like here in Australia, for example, at the moment, there's a public consultation process underway. And so, I, again, I think going back to that point about responsible AI, I think governments will have a role to play here in making sure there are appropriate guardrails, safeguards in place to protect things against bias and privacy and disinformation and misinformation. Um, some people are concerned about the impact on jobs and the workforce and how we might need to respond to that and there might need to be tax reform or education mm -hmm. reform, et cetera. So I, I think there's, there's a lot of work that actually needs to be done and it needs to be done very quickly. Mm -hmm. The technology is moving fast There's developments and announcements and advancements every day. And um, mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of pressure on governments to be thinking yeah. about both the opportunities and risks um, mm -hmm. and, and how they use it themselves and also their own internal policies and frameworks that they need to have to, in terms of adoption, as well as their role as, as, uh, as a regulator. I, I don't know, I can't predict how it will play out in terms of where things will land yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think what we're likely to see is regulation of particularly acute high risk cases yep. that will be, I don't know, banned or considered no fly zones or high vigilance areas. And probably a lot of existing laws and regulations might be adequate or, or you, you don't necessarily need to create a whole lot of new laws. There are already lots of consumer protection and in regulations that might be deemed to be sufficient and just applicable to these new technologies as well. Um, we'll see how that debate plays out. And obviously it's not something that any country can probably do on their own, um, mm -hmm. given the nature of these global technologies, it's, it's probably going to be an international effort and in the yeah. end of the day some alignment globally will probably be uh or consensus will, will probably come yeah to pass. some of the more progressive things i see happening around gen ai are happening in your neck of the woods in australia so everyone everyone's watching right <laughs> we're all we're all uh, waiting to see exactly what the initial use cases and everything look like and as you said regulations are likely coming and we'll have to factor those in I think the moment now is to really engage and mm -hmm. experiment. Yep. The best way to learn, I think, is by doing. So I, I, I think it's important for technology leaders and business leaders to really lean in mm -hmm. now rather than waiting on the sidelines to see how it plays out. I, I, I honestly think we do need to be proactive. I don't think this is a fad. I don't think this is a, mm -hmm. a passing hype, notwithstanding that there probably is a lot of hype yep. and so on. This is a game-changing technology that will have a massive potential productivity gains and opportunities, but also with great power comes great responsibility. So mm -hmm. we actually do need all of our best and brightest people to be leaning in and paying attention to this or there's always the risk we get. We don't get the outcomes we wanted mm -hmm. because we, uh, we weren't proactive enough. Uh, fortunately, I think we're seeing a good response around the world from mm -hmm. people who, who really do care and do want us to do this in a responsible way. And, and I would encourage everyone to really read up and learn and engage as much as they can so that we mm -hmm. can shape it in the right way. Yeah. I appreciate your perspective on that and I applaud your your motivation to push your clients to really be proactive and embrace it. Well, Miguel, it was outstanding having you back on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us all the way from Sydney. You're going to move on with your work day right now, and I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> Thanks for jumping on with me. Let's not wait two years until we do this again. I really appreciate all of our listeners checking out the podcast. I will put a link in the show notes to the BCG article that was referenced. So thank you again, Miguel. I wish you the very best. Thanks very much, Brad. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Thanks for tuning in to Transform Now. For more insightful discussions on digital transformation and more, check out our podcast channel where you'll find all of our previous episodes. 
And to make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player. And if you like what you've heard, please leave us a review. For more information about digital transformation and the future of work, check out blueprism.com to learn how SSNC Blueprism's digital workforce is enabling enterprise transformation now.